Hello, hello. Vinny. Hello. Um, hello, how are you guys? I'm okay. Pretty good, how are you? Man? How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, just a couple things before I start. It's 4 a.m. where I am, so sorry if I'm a bit quiet. Mm -hmm. But, um... Don't worry about uh, it. Yeah, just got a couple of questions. Um, so I don't really want to go into, like, moral stuff, but, like, scientific stuff. I've got a bit of, like, questions. Sure. Um, so what I know, please correct me if I'm wrong, because you guys are obviously insanely more educated than I am, but you, I'm, you guys can't eat eggs, right? Or milk or stuff like that. We can, yeah. we just choose I mean, not, we to. Yeah. not to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so if, like, so obviously you guys are vegan because you, like, don't, like, you don't like harming animals, am I correct? Animal rights, yeah. Animal rights. Yeah, so if you can't eat eggs, but like is farming eggs from chickens actually harming them like if it's just natural the way they do you want to do you want to tell them or shall i no you go for it poopy -poo. i've said it quite a few yeah. times today <laughs> go okay um, yeah so so in the production of eggs before we even get to the point in which we're farming eggs the initial step is to produce leg uh, egg laying hens right so like the chickens that can actually lay the eggs so that means you need a population full of only females so they you know they get a lot of fer fertilized eggs they the breed chickens they get all that fertilized eggs the um, incubate them and then when they hatch they basically put on a conveyor belt you they look at the genitalia of the chickens if they're a female they stay on the conveyor belt and if the male that tossed aside uh, that conveyor belt then usually goes to um, a macerator a big blender and that blender alive um that's day one yeah. from that's from day one um so 50 percent of all chickens that are in the egg industry have already been killed uh from birth um the next the <laughs> so the next step <laughs> is um is then to raise these chickens now a lot of them have been genetically engineered and selectively bred to grow faster so when they do grow they're actually incapable of um of supporting their own weight but we'll get onto that in a second the first thing to do is to realize that these chickens are going to live very cramped and in, in and this is even if they're free range so they're going to live in com uh, communities which are incredibly cramped and uh far too much to psychologic for them to psychologically cope with um chickens can deal with about 100 other chickens before they lose their minds um, and the, the struggle, struggle to cope. Uh, most farms have got about 10,000 chickens. So these chickens go absolutely mental and start murdering each other, um, pecking each other to death and cannibalizing each other, despite not actually, not it, it not being a natural behavior. So the way that the, we deal with that is we sear off their beaks with a hot, um, and the beaks are about, um, are the same kind of uh, material as, you, as your fingernail. They've got the same sort of cuticle. You know, they've got like a, a very, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever damaged a fingernail or anything, but you can actually torture people with with your fingernails because of the nerve endings. They're incredibly sensitive. Yeah, so we, we sear off the, uh, essentially the sear through their beaks, which is incredibly painful for them without anesthetic. Um, and then we throw them in a dark room um, um, and feed them um you know um multiple times a day usually automatically uh the sometimes the like a lot sometimes they're in cages which is even worse if they're in cages then that um then they can't even open their wings um a lot of the time uh, and this is a natural behavior for chickens so they live a life in which they are permanently frustrated from one of their most basic uh behaviors uh moving to the next stage they are then fed until uh, and uh, produce eggs. They produce about 365 eggs uh, a year, about one egg a day. The production of eggs, obviously it's dependent on the chicken, but the production of eggs to that extent has, means that they leach calcium from their bones and often uh, have fractures um, because they're unable to, uh, because of them trying to support that, that, that mass uh, and also because the... Um, the, they've got no calcium in the bones to actually like hold them up like the bones are hollow and well the bones are already hollow but the, i think actually but the bones are, are not strong enough to support that weight so they have fractures and the, they suffer pain if they're in if they're in cages sometimes their um claws that their talons um actually gets like because they don't move for so long they actually become attached they actually grow around the the cage itself so when they're getting pulled out of the cages and sent to slaughter the their legs get ripped off um 
so the they go through this i think for 35 months is it am i right is it is it it's three to five years isn't it actually is it three to five years that the, the, the yeah, it's, it's three to five years yeah yes yeah, three Three to five years, yeah. So they lay eggs for three to five years, and in that time, they, they you know, they go through these horrible conditions where they um, suffer extreme stress and um, never see daylight, um, usually. And then, um, then at the end of it, they are um, ripped out of their cages, or you know, uh, you know, forced into baskets. A lot of the time, they're unwilling, so the farm hands get um, very stressed with them because they've got a quarter to meet and a, in a certain amount of time. So often they get maliciously beaten um anyway so then whatever way they get there they end up going to the slaughterhouse when they get to the slaughterhouse um they're put on um they usually put on a factory line uh that they don't necessarily want to get on they're hooked up upside down sometimes they, they go through this um this uh water stunner so that the, there's essentially an automatic stunning device which is to prevent them from feeling pain a lot of the time those malfunction um and um don't adequately stun the animal or if they do stun the animal um uh it's the, the there's still problems and so we'll get onto that so then they're moving through sometimes the stunners don't work and they just don't bother using them so they move through the the stunner sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't and then they either automatically do this or they do it by hand so if it's they're doing it by hand then uh there are individuals who are stood there slitting the throats of chickens one by one um in which they are cutting their heads off in which they bleed out and die um if they are if it's automatic then there is basically a razor blade which slits that throat but sometimes but because it's set to an average height of a chicken some chickens are too short some chickens are too uh big and um it slices either through that skull or and part of the head off or it um slices through that body and then the bleed out slowly and in pain and sometimes they're not even stunned um so this is, um, and, and then this isn't even including the abuse that they face a lot of the time at the hands of slaughterhouse workers who are described as have, of having a dark sense of humor. Sometimes they rip the heads off of chickens. Um, sometimes they're told to rip the heads off of chickens because the, there's problems with the machinery and they're told that the best way to kill it would just be to rip its head off. Um, sometimes they're known to do things like squeeze the shit out of them, like just crush them uh, to squeeze the shit onto each other and stuff and laugh about it. Um, so no, there's... There's, uh, the, the industry itself is actually really brutal and horrible, um, and it, it increases likelihood of loads of different horrible stuff for humans as well. One, because we've got a lot of um, crazy individuals who develop a, you know, a, a, a psychology based around killing animals for, uh, for a living, killing thousands of birds a day, and um, we'll also um, have a risk of zoonotic diseases, which, you know, like bird flu, which pops up every couple of years and comes with the possibility of, of a real possibility of global pandemic, which is far worse than COVID since I think H1N1 had a mortality rate of about 30%. So when we look at it, like the industry itself comes with a lot of ethical problems. Okay. Yeah, hey, I get that. So I'll like if... take... Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Thank you for explaining that. But let's say there was like a family run business, like completely run from, by a family. And they just had farms and they had cows out the back, just a big acreage property. And it wasn't owned by any company, no like industrial, no whatever. Back your and, hands up. Yeah. So they just went out there and milked the cows, got their eggs from the chickens who lived free, and they sold them to like locally and like no like harm is involved. It's just completely family old, like owned. Would you guys drink that milk? Because it doesn't involve any harm at all. It doesn't involve any so let's explain why. So one, for them to obtain the chickens in the first place, so when they buy the chickens to raise, 50% of them have already been blended alive. So just supporting the industry which blends chickens alive um, is wrong in itself. So them buying the chickens to put in their backyard uh, is already causing a considerable amount of harm. Then the chickens that they do have, okay, they live quite a good life. One, like taking eggs from a chicken, they're actually, um, they're placed under, they, they don't actually like people touching their eggs. Like, you know, what a surprise um so they get pretty just they, uh, they get a lot they're pretty stressed about it so you've got to actually wait for the chicken to so they not only have you got to wait for it to not um to lay the egg but you've actually got to wait for it to discard the egg to not show interest in the egg because it realizes it's unfertilized and at that point if you take it it doesn't get stressed out um but that takes an extra couple of days which slows production um so you end up producing less eggs again um then you've got to feed them um then if you do take it too soon as well, they start producing another egg 
um because like they get like it's it's part of their instinct like if they start as soon as the egg's gone they start producing another one um like out of stress and so you end up with them producing way more eggs than their bodies can cope with so you've actually got to put calcium in their diet so because these eggs have been selectively bred as well and genetically engineered they need calcium in their diet so the only way that you could ever do this is if you rescued chickens rather than bought them like so you saved them from slaughter um and then when you had them you um you know you allow them to lay their eggs but they're not very good at laying eggs now because they're old spent chickens and we're getting sent to slaughter for that reason um when they do lay their eggs uh, in a much slower rate you've got to make sure that you're feeding them high quality food so that they're not um they're not going to have like fractures and stuff like that and face pain and then once you've got that egg um you you know then you can do whatever with what with it with what you want right but then let's say in five years let's say you get a three-year-old chicken um it's only got let's say or a four-year-old chicken so it's got like one uh, a year left of laying eggs if you're lucky when it hits that like five-year-old kind of mark and it no longer lays eggs are you going to send that uh, that chicken to slaughter because if you're not and let's say you're trying to run a business then you're going to have a yard full of chickens who do nothing but eat food um and cost you money so it becomes ec uh, economically almost impossible you're getting eggs that are being laid um like once every couple of like once every couple of days maybe a week um you've got to um sell those eggs rather quickly because they're already going bad and you've also got to pray for high higher quality food and obtain these chickens not from standard uh businesses but from um you know from like um, a supply chain which is incredibly ins unstable like there's no there's no economy that can actually function this way like you, you would not be able to function work, uh, like have a business that worked ethically like that and that's just for chickens uh for cows it gets even worse man like cows only produce milk when they're pregnant so you've got to impregnate the cow and again you've got to think about where these cows are coming from but let's just say you managed to source a cow which you could then impregnate You've got to think about what you've got to have a bull to impregnate it um, or you've got to rent a bull to impregnate it. And you, when you're renting that bull, you've got to think about whether that bull is going to be sent to slaughter at a certain period of time and whether it's being used as, you know, an object and not treated fairly. So let's say you are either paying a massive amount to rent a bull or you are doing it like artificial insemination. Now, artificial insemination requires essentially what's what the industry describes as a rape rack or some means of tying the animal down so it doesn't resist forcing your arm into its anus and injecting bull semen inside of it um which i think is grotesque and wrong and then um especially since the cow resists now once the cow is pregnant it then um it starts lactating so it starts lactating and it starts like you know its glands swell um and it uh, experiences like a little bit of pain with that which is why you'd probably justify uh milking it right so you'd be like oh well it's in pain if i don't milk it it'll keep feeling pain and it'll swell too much right so let's say you milk that cow whilst it's pregnant but then once it actually gives birth to the child well then the like the calf then the ch then the calf actually needs to suckle and if it doesn't suckle then it's not going to grow up and it's not going to grow up strong and healthy it's going to have diminished immunity and um it's not and and also the calf has a, the calf and cow have a um a, like basically a maternal bond uh the cow actually cares about the well-being of the calf right so this is all going on and you're trying to milk the cow except you can't milk the cow because the calf's drinking all of the milk um and so you have this this issue where the only way you're going to get the milk is if you send the calf away or remove the calf away from its mother which causes them severe which causes them stress the cows have been known to cry out for days for their calves chase uh vans and stuff in which their calves have been taken on uh, loads of stuff because they have a maternal bond and um and a lot of the time you've got to now think about what you're doing with this calf if it's a male it does it will never produce milk so it is an it's an economic liability it is again just going to eat your food and never make you money so you're either going to have to kill it or you're going to have to have a cow a bull that just lives in your garden and it can't mate with the other cow because the other cow is uh, <laughs> is a, a female its mother <laughs> um rather so this um this uh this is a really precarious situation which is just an economic you know drain no one in their right mind would run this business you know
You've actually completely proved that point to me, touche. But yeah, thank you. Um, I've got one more point. Um, so you guys are obviously trying to like spread a message, like why aren't you vegan yet? Like mm. why aren't you like trying to prove to why like being vegan is the better option? Um, in my opinion, to be honest, I don't. I think it's kind of impossible to spread this message to the amount of people that these industries would be shut down. That um, no. like. Well, that might be fundamentally not understanding how some of the systems work. Like, for example, things propping up the dairy industry currently are, are lobbying and subsidies. So money gets funneled into these these industries so that they um, they can be propped up. Like in the UK, um, Pippa, you might remember a bit more about this, but our dairy industry struggles quite heavily and does need to be heavily subsidised in order for it to continue. And if you have enough people... You don't. We've seen this with other, you know, social justice movements. You didn't need everybody, you know, um, advocating for women's rights for women to then have those rights. It was a loud minority calling for something, um, you know, and having those demands met. And I don't think that we're going to need like even the majority in order to affect subsidisation and lobbying to the point where then actual supply and demand speaks for itself. And then I think that we'll see a, a massive decline in those products and then those products will probably um, increase in price and the, the plant-based versions will become more affordable because they're less resource intensive uh, and the demand will increase as more people are consuming those products because even non-vegans at this point are, are consuming these products. Um, and I, I think we will see an effect, uh, like, I, I don't know if you've heard of an innovation curve, but I think it will probably follow that, whereby we'll see a, a drastic increase as soon as those uh, the subsidies are dealt with. And um, yeah, as soon as we hit maybe even even like 20 percent vegans, like I think we could probably have a massive impact on, on those industries. I don't know what you think, PP. No, I, I completely agree. I think you mm -hmm. put it really well. Um, I think that that's exactly what that's happening. You know, um, if you notice that a lot of vegan products have dropped in price yeah um, they over have time. Yeah, i've noticed that like uh, quite a few th products like there's these porkless pies in, in in like tesco they've dropped 30p out of nowhere like just uh, that's a, mm -hmm. it's really it's really doing quite well mm -hmm. it is really doing like some of the businesses are doing really well just because of the innovate like because of innovation and because of increased demand mm -hmm. uh the more vegans you get buying the products the more money that plant-based alternatives have to invest and compete with the meat products and the, it's economies of scale like if I have a small market, I've got to put the prices higher to to pay for the supplies that I need for production. But if I have a larger market, then I can drop the price point lower and still make a and I can make an even bigger profit so long as I've got more people buying it. So this is this is like what's called the elasticity of supply and well the elasticity of demand. Um, you know how many people can you get buying? Like the percentage of people who would buy it at a lower price. Um, and I think that these products are, have a considerable elasticity. Um, and I think that meat, meat, dairy and eggs don't have that much last elasticity, which is why you seem to have people um, kind of even staying away from milk now more and more, just moving to plant based alternatives. But also, you know, dairy farmers complain all the time that they're not getting the sales necessary to sustain their business. And they're required that they're relying upon in the UK at the minute. Well, actually, the last time I checked, it was under common agricultural policy in in Europe. Um, dairy farmers were being supplied. Uh, Sixty percent of the profits that dairy farmers received come from come from uh, came from uh, came from European um, subsidization, like central, like Europe's just given farmers money. Like here, um, because of all the um, uh, items you've made, you get this X amount of money. Now there is an issue there because they get certain amount of money that has nothing to do with sales. It's just how much they produce, right? That's the problem with subsidization. It removes uh, its sort of, its, its attempt. It's, it, it's meant to mitigate supply and demand, like, like negatives of demand. So if the, you, you don't have the demand or, you, you know, um, it's supposed to encourage supply so that you can keep prices lower um, rather than, you know, essentially relying upon markets to uh, form some sort of equilibrium. Now, the thing is, is Britain luckily has changed its um, subsidization policy. So all we are already, you know, vegans are already, you know, campaign against subsidization for farms. 
Um, but the beautiful thing is, is that subsidization for farms now in the UK are tied to profit. So the less money that, you know, dairy farms make or any of these animal products make because people are buying vegan alternatives, the lower that subsidization is going to be. So what you have is a, is a, um, uh, you know, a cyclic effect, like a cascade effect in which if people stop buying animal products now in the UK, people will also, the price of animal products will be forced to go up. And because the, the price of animal products will be forced to go up, less people will buy them. And you can see how this is going to continue onwards. Um, and so when we're looking at, you know, how many people we need, I think I, I saw an estimate that would only need about 11 to 20% of the population to switch to a vegan diet and then meat, dairy and eggs would collapse. Uh, in terms of in terms of animal products, they wouldn't be able to sustain sustain themselves in the market because the way that the require like the amount of individuals they need to buy their products to sustain themselves uh, in terms of the economy of scale is massive. If you think of the costs involved of animal agriculture, they're pretty huge. Uh, you need to grow animals for numerous years. You need to feed them every day. You need to pay for people to look after them. You need to pay for the housing, the shelter, the water. Um, you need to pay for the land in which they live on. It's honestly, it's an incredibly um, ineffective or a very costly business. Uh, and it doesn't produce a lot of money, which is why the government's already intervening. So I don't, I don't, I, I, quite the opposite. I think that veganism is inevitable. I think that capitalism will push veganism forward because any business person with the right mind will see more money in taking a raw resource, uh, which has to be then uh, take the raw resource that's being, um, you know, transformed and um, that, well, let's say they can actually just take one resource transform that into an alternative product rather than having to pump loads of money in, uh, multi, you know, buying multiple resources, uh, increasing their costs tenfold uh, to produce a product which is at a relatively similar price point. If you think about how much milk costs versus plant milk, it's not even that different. And if you think about having to pay for oats rather than paying for, uh, I don't know, like 50,000 cows, um, it's a real big difference. So no, I think capitalism will push veganism, man. Hey, uh, yeah, I get that. But I'm gonna be honest. I couldn't see within at least the next fifty years, Macca's, oh, sorry, McDonald's or like Burger King or Hungry Jack shutting down, or like I just could not imagine that persuading they're not, no, that much not. people to like Wait, go they're... vegan and stop shopping there. The, the... You've got like the. They've just got them out. up plant, yeah, or something like that. It, it wouldn't oh, wait, be that yeah, they that shut down. True. It would be that yeah. they just serve plant-based foods. That is true. So it costs it's... less for them to do it, man. Like, think of it like this. They, they, like, rather than, like, if they can charge you the exact same amount for a burger, which costs them half as much to produce, why, in the, why would they give you uh, a burger that costs them twice as much to produce? That is true, yeah. Oh, and, and you said if you can't imagine it like the bbc can they actually wrote an article that in 50 years that the uk will be vegan yeah in in they are they're also um saying that in about 2025 there are some estimates like there was like this billionaire philanthropist i can't remember his name saying that by 2025 he thinks um we'll eat 50 percent of the the animal products that we do in the uk and, and you know and as well like actually if you look at where investments coming from into these plant-based businesses You've got like billionaires investing into vegan meats uh, and vegan meat alternatives. There's, mm -hmm. They're becoming billion dollar industries. And, uh, and the they're trajectory getting insight. Like they're getting insight that we're not. They're seeing, they're, you know, they're being, you know, having conversations with people who are like top of their game. They know they can see ahead of, of the curve when it comes to consumption and, and, and you know, profit. And then they're, they're conveying this information. So it would tell you that, that they they know something that like it is probably yeah, yeah. quite. Yeah, absolutely. It's, Sorry. These are what are called blue ocean markets as well. Mm -hmm. So like because there's not as much competition, the more more investment that you put in at this stage, the more it's going to pay off. So if you invest in, let's say, a plant like a plant like meat, like, a, like I don't know, like some sort of like vegan meat business right now and you buy so many shares in that business, in 10, 15 years, your shares might have 10x because that market has like quadrupled in size. So like it's 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 exactly the businesses and like, right now I would say veganism is probably one of the most um, lucrative things to invest in. And that's why you can see McDonald's that move into make vegan options and you can see all of these corporations producing vegan meats. And the population at the end of the day 
really just conform. Um, honestly, as a, as I'm a socialist, trying to get the population to actually, um, you know, challenge the markets at all is is is, is like it's like impossible. So um, I think that like most people, if you can convince them to boycott animal products, I think there'll be a big change there. Um, and I think that the rest of the population will just basically go along to get along. I don't think they're going to be right and in the streets because they've got to eat McVegans over, uh, you know, that double, like that quarter pounders. Okay. So, yeah, I get what, like, what you're saying with, like, the Hungry Jacks, like, converting to whatever, like, the, the vegan-based options. That's actually really good. Um, I forgot his name. I had a conversation in chat with, I think it was Abe. Yeah, it was him. I had a conversation with him about... I think he sent something, but I didn't read it. But um, oh, this guy sent me in chat. Um, about how like a diet, like a plant-based diet and like a meat-based diet, or like omnivores, could like is perfectly sustainable. Um, I've like so with my tr personal trainer, he says like gives me diets each day, and there's plenty of meat in it. But in I don't think that like if you had a meat diet full of like steak and all this meat to get built or whatever to have a fit healthy life could be the same as just eating plants like just straight up like why not i don't it's just because like the nutri uh, like prove me wrong completely prove me wrong if i'm wrong because okay. like, you're obviously way more education than i am but to be honest it w what i think meat would have much more nutrients and healthy beneficials than just eating plants excuse me um well, not really. Like, actually, quite the opposite. If you look, uh, there's actually a documentary. There's a really good documentary called Game Changers on Netflix. It's um, uh, it's all about like v uh, athletes turning vegan essentially because it bec it comes with athletic benefits. Like, um, so you've got a few things to consider here. Like, when you're eating meat, you're usually eating it. Like, people usually go like meat in terms of macronutrients. They're like protein, but that protein comes with a shit ton of saturated fat, um, usually, and is and other carcinogens and other like um and other issues which increase uh, inf inflammation. So like, if you know anything, when you, you, know, when, uh, you know when you're working out and you eat um, and, and you, uh, you're sore for the next couple of days, you, you're experiencing inflammation um, from like tearing your muscles, right? And so if you want to increase your recovery rate, then you need to eat a low inflammatory diet so that you can get back to the gym uh, as soon as possible and work out again. That's why, like, so you want a high recovery rate, especially if you're like a peak athlete. The more you, the faster you recover, the more, you, the better you are going to perform, right? Because you're going to increase your volume, and you know that's essentially increasing your, um, uh, you're essentially your, um, your overload, right? So you end up, um, so let's just like, so look at it like this: a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, if you're doing it right, right? Like, you know, you could eat like, you, you know, if either people are eating just Doritos and shit, rather the vegan Doritos or, you know, meat, like, you know, like uh, non-vegan Doritos, I think we're going to agree the person going to the gym is going to suck. Um, but the, if you're both eating a healthy diet, the, the vegan diet is anti-inflammatory whilst the meat diet is actually pro-inflammatory. So you end up, you, you end up seeing vegan athletes uh, or athletes, when they switch to a vegan diet, actually increase their performance. They actually end up doing better. Doing better. There's like loads of vegan bodybuilders. There's like Patrick Baboumian. He's like a vegan bodybuilder. He, he won um, when he was vegan. He won um, the uh, I think he, he got the world record in the yoke lift. Um, you've got um, I'm trying to think of other. Like, you've got like what's, what's he called? Is it John Wilkes? He's like an ex, ex Do you mean ex James Wilkes, the guy who made, produced Wilkes. it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was like an, he's like an ex Marine. Um, I'm trying to think of other, like Serena Williams, like tennis player. Mm -hmm. Like that, Serena and Vanessa, I think they're both vegan. Um, Pretty I'm trying to think. Um, Who's the um, tennis like... player? Um, he's really good. The, 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 like one of the best tennis players Popovich. ever. Is it Djokovic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Djokovic. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's Djokovic. Is vegan. There's like there's loads of vegan athletes now, right? Like and and like there's like there's NFL something. players and stuff mm -hmm. like that are vegan and stuff. Like the, there's like quite a few like vegan athletes. Like Mr. Universe 2014's vegan. Like the the thing is is that um or 2012 one of the two. Um, you, you if if you just Google Mr. Mr. Universe vegan, you'll see him with these like the giant muscly man with his tiny little dog. Uh, anyway, the thing is, is that um, like, 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 there are loads of vegan athletes, 
and that's pretty much because of the the rates of inflammation now when we talk about protein or like like so for example nutrients like you can get any nutrient like the, the animals get the nutrients from plants in the first place right that's kind of like 101 uh, obviously animals can digest things you can't like for example grass like and things like that but in reality like when you're eating plants you can you can get everything that uh that exists in meat the most like you know prominent nutrients that you need to consider or that people consider are protein uh vitamin d iron vitamin a um and vitamin b12 so vit uh protein you can get protein from beans lentils legumes um all of which come with massive health benefits especially um you know high levels of fiber which are really great for um um you know uh, re removing toxins from the body uh essentially uh it's the it's the number one nutrient associated with longevity you've got um and that doesn't and obviously other nutrients there's there's actually loads of other nutrients things like um as, even associated with the fiber and its breakdown in your gut which does a load of good for you you can go and look at yourself because there's so much information um on this then you've got let's say iron you can get iron all over the place you get it from like uh you can get iron from like black beans. I'm trying to think of other sources of iron. So like I think red lentils are pretty high in iron. Do you know any? I'm trying to think of other sources of iron off the top of my head. Um, do you know any good sources of iron off the top of your head? Because I'm trying to remember them yeah, now. Yeah, just beans um, and like dark leafy greens are always a good dark source. Greens, yeah. yeah. But primarily, I think yeah. it's beans are like the best for plant food. I can't, I can't recall. I think there's like so like lentils, chickpeas, and stuff like yeah. that. I think um, legumes and beans. Yeah, I just your yeah. go-to for that. Tofu is actually I think pretty good. Oh, I think tofu, chia yeah. seeds are alright. I think and hemp seeds and stuff as well. I think uh, and and I think dates and stuff are actually pretty good. Like um, oh yeah, dates are quite high in iron. Yeah, and so like I think raisins are as well and stuff like that. Um, and then obviously you can get like if you're eating any wheat product anyway, it's fortified and elemental iron. Mm -hmm. Um, so anything with wheat in it, like any sort of like breaded product, any if you bread at all, that's already got iron added to it. Mm -hmm. Um, like cereals, they have iron added to them. Um, oh, and then, as well. Someone said yeah, molasses. molasses yeah, molasses. Like mm -hmm. Um, and then you've got uh, vitamin D. Vitamin D you can get from the sun. Um, if you don't want to get it from the sun and you want to eat it, you can eat vitamin D too. You can get that from mushrooms, especially if you put mushrooms in the sun. Uh, it, it can like 100x like or uh, even like 100,000 increase the amount of vitamin D too. It's also fortified in plant milks. Um, and if you want to get vitamin D3, you can buy a vitamin D3 supplement. Um, the same way as you can buy, a, like I think loads of people buy vitamin D supplements, except vitamin D3, vegan vitamin D3 supplements usually comes from mushrooms. Uh, like shiitake mushrooms where uh, non-vegan vitamin d3 supplements comes from like sheep sheep wool oil um yeah, lanolin lanolin yeah mm -hmm. um that like boil the sheep's wool and then scrape off the scum off the top and that's what they put in a capsule i know what i'd rather um, <laughs> like yeah. not only ethically uh, but like uh, i know it makes, it makes us part cringe it does make us part cringe mm. um and then and then you've got uh, vitamin A. So in in you know plants, you've got that's beta carotene. So sweet potatoes, carrots, pretty much orange things, um, usually quite high in vitamin A. Uh, anything that's high in beta carotene, I think like cabbage. There's loads of other foods. Like there's loads of foods that like are high in beta carotene. It's not. It's it's really super easy to get beta carotene. Um, you can convert that to uh, vit to retinol, which is vitamin A. So it's pre vitamin A. Um, and uh, if you eat it with fat, it massively increases your absorption. Um, so if you, if you did, if you were concerned, you could always have like carrots and hummus and then, and then you've got your vitamin A. Um, uh, you know, like this is the thing. It's, it's actually like super easy. It's like, it doesn't even take that much planning. Um, you don't have to think about where you're getting all of these nutrients independently. You just have a very diet. As long as you've got like a pretty varied diet, you're going to hit all of these nutrients the same way as you would on a, on a meat-based diet, but you don't have the saturated fat and cholesterol, which are associated with, you know, diabetes, um heart disease alzheimer's um you know what well actually 14 out of 15 of, un of our number one causes of death so in terms of like you know like you see all these like meat like these bodybuilders and these meatheads dying i mean dying young for two reasons one because a lot of them on steroids and they've enlarged their hearts and stuff but a lot of the time it's because they're actually having heart disease from the amount of cholesterol that they have in their blood uh, in their bloodstream um and that's causing loads of issues for them right so if you, you know if you have the advantage if you if you truly care about athletic performance and longevity you can build you know into a big strong boy with uh with plants you just got to do it right and you can even avoid you know some pretty nasty diseases along the way
So yeah, man, it's it's no problem. Hell, not even oh, just yeah. big strong um, boys. You can be a big strong girl. <laughs> I, I go oh, to yeah, the I gym. Just, I, I get I, thick. I, but he, I, was, I was gonna say like he he. I said he could grow into it. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, okay. Don't worry, Pepe. Sorry, Benny. What were right, you gonna thank say? Thank you so much. That's all. That's all I really had. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Vinny. See ya. Uh, I'll move you to the audience. See you later. Bye, oh, man. Oh, that was lovely, wasn't that, Pee Pee?